Um, so we have our second presentation that Nicholas is going to deliver for us and it's on his paper entitled Testing and Hardening IoT Devices Against the Merari Botnet. Um, so Nicholas, over to you whenever you're ready. And the same thing guys, if there's any questions, pop them up um, as they arise um, throughout the presentation and then we'll cover them at the end. Hello. Perfect, we can hear you now. Yeah. Uh, my name is Nicolas Petropakis. I'm a lecturer. Uh, I work for Andy Napier University. Um, I'm going to present your latest uh, work, which is called Testing and Hardening IoT Devices Against the Mirai Botnet. It was uh, a joint effort uh, from Andy Napier University and uh, the Department of Digital Systems uh, of the University of Piraeus. In Greece. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about the threat uh, landscape, motivate you a bit about the problem. Then uh, I'm going to keep up with the Mirai botnet and a few things about it. Uh, I'm going to continue with our experimental setup and the results that we got. And of course, I'm going to conclude our work and offer some future directions. First of all, Internet of Things or IoT as we like to call them. We refer to a couple of electronic devices that collect data uh, through sensors that are attached to them. And what are they doing with those data? They usually transfer them via the internet to a larger, more powerful, powerful infrastructure so we can process uh, them afterwards. Uh, the thing is, why do we care by, about Internet of Things and IoT devices because they have become more popular uh, as we constantly use more and more devices throughout our everyday life. On the top left, you can see uh, a stats the plot where 23.14 uh, billion of devices were connected on the year during the year 2018. And they have a projection that until the year of 2025, we will have approximately 75.44 billion devices. This should make sense. And you just have to take a look either in your close environment or around. Think of your friends, your colleagues, four or five years ago, the number of IoT devices they were using and the number of IoT devices they are currently using. However, as you all know, along with every uh, emerging technology, the malicious parties are motivated to participate and serve their own cause. So think of as an example, the operating systems. Until 15 years ago, we had Windows seriously dominating the market. They still are, in a sense. And all the malware that were being produced back then were basically meant for Windows. No one working for the malicious parties was attracted by Linux or Mac OS. Currently, as the usage of all those operating systems is being increased even slightly, uh, it projects more profitability for the malicious parties and that's why they turn their attention to them. 10 years ago, it was the motto that use Mac OS, you won't uh, have to deal with viruses. Right now, more and more people are using antiviruses uh, when it, installations when it comes to Mac OS. Returning back to the IoT devices, uh, we have some statistics as well here. Symantec observed the growth of 600% from the year 2016 to 2017 when it came to cyber attacks against IoT devices. F5 Labs measured a 280% growth in attacks on IoT devices for the year 2017 to 2018, while F Secure noticed a surge of 300% when it came to cyber attacks in only the year 2019. And to be specific, over 2.9 billion events were observed by their global uh, network of honeypots in the first half of 2019. So what 
can we conclude for those statistics and uh, the respective plots that you see on your left is that IoT devices are becoming more and more popular, so they draw the attention of malicious parties. What the malicious parties are trying to do, as we are talking about extremely minimal devices compared to all the other computational units we use in our everyday life, they want to weaponize them. How are they supposed to achieve that? One of uh, the known uh, attacks is uh, to take control of those devices as the malicious parties would do with every other computational device and serve their malicious cause like that. I'm drawing your attention to botnets, okay? So what the malicious parties are trying to do is infect the devices, get control over them and then weaponize them, use a group or large volumes of devices basically to perform attacks. The commonest attack that we usually see is the den distributed denial of service attacks. One famous botnet that we noticed on 2016, uh, basically the news came from Malware Must Die, a security research blog, which discovered the malware that really shook the world and the security community back then. What was special about that malware is that it was created using the executable and linkable format binaries, which are very common on operating systems such as Linux. What it does, it basically, it's very simplistic, uh, its operation. It targets SSH or Telnet protocols and it exploits hard-coded and default credentials on many devices uh, to access those services. Um, so basically, it's just a brute forcing attack as initial attack vector, if you think about that. And it does it using a targeted database of known credentials for specified brands and manufacturers of IoT devices. Remember, I will take you back again 10 years ago when we had the first routers, uh, the first broadband coming, uh, into popularity and there were a lot of applications in the first distributions uh, of smartphones which had a list of known passwords from uh, popular vendors um, of routers and then you could let's say kind of crack the the router of your neighbor it was extremely easy you didn't have, even have to brute force back then so mirai is brute forcing some statistics about mirai you see on the uh, top left plot that uh, we have percentages of the devices being effect infected and uh, Brazil is first with 15%, then we have Colombia with 14, Vietnam with 12.5% and other countries such as China, South Korea, Russia, Turkey, India, Taiwan and Argentina. Does it mean that uh, this is extremely realistic? This is only happening. It has to do First of all, with measurements, and secondly, believing that it is realistic, we should consider the uh, cybersecurity situational awareness. Okay, we should understand that for the past few years, it's being promoted over and over again. Personally, this is what I'm trying to, uh, to do. I encourage people to secure themselves from non attacked actors. This is my life. Uh, um, uh, my work's uh, purpose. And then you see another plot on your bottom left, uh, which records the DNS lookup volume over time for uh, major variants of the Mirai botnet. And it's very visible that we have peaks, which are distinguishable from uh, mid-October 2016 to mid-November 2016, and then another one spanning over uh, December 2016. Going now to our experimental setup. First of all, uh, let me explain to you our hypothesis. We wanted to check everyday devices. Okay, as I told you, uh, our lab's purpose and in general, my mentality has to do with uh, encouraging people to be aware, to, to, to notice things. So we took three everyday devices and one virtual, and we tried to test them. First of all, we used two virtual machines. One was acting as a controller for Mirai, capturing reports uh, once the exploitation had taken place and 
they were trying to deploy the malware's code. And we had a second one, a second virtual machine, which was connected to the router attached to the devices. When it comes to the Mirai malware, we need to take into consideration that uh, it needs two servers. One is needed to run the command and control aspect, as well as the MySQL database, which collects and stores the bot information. You, you build an army, but somehow you need to, to, uh, uh, to be able to command that army. And the second server is used to act as a scan receiver and a bot loader. The bot loader will use the advanced scene scanner that you can uh, easily use if you're using a map. Now, going to the devices that we used, you see uh, three out of four of them. The fourth is virtualized, so you can really imagine it. Uh, you see three out of four of them. First of all, we use that cool ED, uh camera, uh, which uses Telnet running, running BusyBox and HTTP. We assume that Mirai would be successful to infect that device uh, and compromise it. Then we used a Raspberry Pi, which was running both Telnet and SSH, as well as uh, HTTP. A CIRCAM IP camera, which is the last uh, figure that you see, which proved to be our secure choice. And last, an IoT simulated device, which was running Ubuntu with uh, BusyBox. So we were also running a Telnet server with a BusyBox installation. Here you can see illustrated our uh, testbed environment, which are which I described previously, where we connected all of our devices. Uh, and I will go through each stage of uh, our experiment. First of all, stage one involves the setup of the network and the devices. Uh, we want to, to configure those networks, uh, those devices, sorry, through the two virtual machines running and being ready to serve commands. Then we set it up the Mirai malware we edited the code and uh, all, all, we did all the required setup to, uh, for the command and control server in the first virtual machine so we can begin the infection process which we did. Uh, stage three, after we got the feedback from uh, the results, we designed and implemented some security measures which again are pretty simplistic if you think about it. I will present them later, uh, based on the post uh, exposure analysis. And last, we run the stage two again. So we perform the attack again, and we checked whether our new uh, security measures were effective or not. Some attack observations when it came to uh, those devices. First of all, the malware would connect to the device, to the IP address 5.206.225.96 on the port 23, uh, because it was attempted to connect and gain root access uh, by brute forcing the login credentials. Some of the devices that we used were running HTTP protocol on port 80, uh, which is rather insecure because it's prone to interception and eavesdropping by attackers. In the release of uh, the Mirai source code online, uh, which was uploaded by the claimed author Anna Senpai, there was a text file uh, in the post, which clarified somehow of uh, how it could be used. It explained that the port uh, 48101 was used to prevent multiple instances of the bots running together, and therefore it was partially needed for the malware to operate correctly. Um, going to the IP cameras, which are becoming more and more popular in our days, uh, you see the advertisements uh, going through the web all the time, either if you want to uh, monitor a young member of the family, such as a baby, or either the interior of the exterior of your uh, property when you're away. So well, those IP cameras are beginning to integrate smartphone applications uh, into their devices. So we as users can see the live feed. And as I told you, we're tracking like the baby or we're tracking live uh, our property. Um, Another feature that if you have used those uh, devices, it's obvious, is that you can get some email alerts uh, via SMTP protocol to your own uh, email address in case you want to be uh, modified. So in case you don't want the notification from the app itself, you can get the email notification. Uh, the FTP servers are normally enabled by default on the other devices and they can be used to transfer files from uh, uh, and to the device, which is rather dangerous as you think about it. So what about the attack outcomes? First of all, the cool 
EAD ca IP camera. We managed to crack its credentials uh, because it, they were included, the default credentials were included in the Mirai password list. The revised was compromised in nine seconds. Uh, the Raspberry Pi, we pre-configured it with default credentials and it, we assumed that a large majority of uh, Raspberry Pi users, they're not going to change them, which is true, uh, as they are amateurs to the computing industry. So again, that device was successfully compromised in 11 seconds. Going to the CIRC um, uh, IP camera, here was our here we were excited to see that although we found that it could leak the video footage without any credentials needed through the ONVIF network streaming using the VLC player, uh, its lack of open ports did not allow us to compromise it. So here we were unsuccessful. Going to the IoT simulated device, again, we designed it to have default credentials uh, and Mirai managed to compromise it in nine seconds as well. As I told you, the step three was to come up with some uh, hardening mechanisms that could prevent Mirai from compromising those devices again. So one of the defensive actions that we chose was changing the Telnet credentials, which was achieved by changing the password in the Cooley EAD camera, disabling Telnet and making SSH's primary protocol in the Raspberry Pi 3. In the Siricam, nothing of what I'm going to talk about uh, is applying as the ports were not enabled by default. So in the case of the simulated IoT device, we change the password again. We also decided to change the Telnet port. We randomized it in a cool EAD camera in the Raspberry Pi and the simulated IoT device. We also changed the web browser credentials. So we changed the password in the cool EAD camera, Raspberry Pi and the IoT device. We disabled the SMTP protocol. It was not available uh, by default in the cool EAD camera. In the case of the Raspberry Pi, we uh, disabled the protocol, uh, removing the root privileges and it was also not available in the simulated IoT device. We replaced the HTTP with HTTPS, which uh, was only achieved in the case of Raspberry Pi 3, which we, where we also used self-signed SSL certificates. And uh, we made the BusyPost shell exclusive to root. So only root was allowed uh, in the case of uh, the cool EAD camera, in the case of Raspberry Pi 3, again, only root login. And in the case of the simulated IoT device. As I said, we didn't have to perform anything when it came to the Siricam because by, by scratch uh, it, it couldn't be infected using uh, our initial tool set. Uh, we performed the experiment again. We tried to attack our devices and none of them was successfully compromised. So it means that our uh, uh, our work uh, was successful. What we can conclude that apparently three out of four devices were vulnerable to the Mirai malware and they became infected. Uh, what proved it was that was proved that the factory, factory configurations are not sufficient and at, at an acceptable level for consumers. And that means that the devices are exposed. The defensive measures that we came up with was not rocket science, were pretty simplistic. However, they were extremely successful. So they met our expectations, our security configurations, and they proved to work. None of the devices could be infected again. What we need to take into consideration is that as the size of the botnet grows, the attacks become more sophisticated because we have an arms race between the malicious parties and the defenders. And what the malicious parties are trying to achieve is weaponize those devices and eventually manage to take down uh, way more complicated infrastructures, uh, which might as well be power grids. And if you turn your attention to the latest Horizon 2020 calls, they were asking for measures and defensive mechanisms that can protect the power grids, especially when they become more and more connected uh, to the internet through the IoT devices. 
Our end goal as a team, what we want to achieve is they create a, an automated software tool that will evaluate the vulnerabilities of the information devices against, of course, known attack factors, so we can support both the producers and the consumers. I'm talking about both uh, known attack vectors because uh, we cannot encourage the, the anomaly detection when it comes to pretty simplistic uh, devices such as the IoT devices because many of them uh, do not have sufficient uh, computational powers and uh, again it has, they have to communicate with uh, a central location and uh, a way uh, bigger in scale infrastructure so we, we can achieve anomaly detection. So initially I think it's rather good uh, giving the circumstances to go uh, with the known, known attack vectors. Uh, we already have uh, a question. So uh, Andrew is asking, how can we encourage or ensure consumers change default passwords on IoT devices? I think, first of all, we as academics need to communicate the news and need to talk to the people around us because uh, personally, I need to secure the devices of almost my home family. Nobody is electronically educated. They uh, they have no idea of what is happening in the real world and then it it comes to the manufacturers themselves so uh, either in the manual that everybody uh, usually disposes to the garbage so manual is uh, let's say plan uh, plan b but plan a should be on the box uh, having a small tag that it says uh, attention First thing you need to do is change the password of your device. Otherwise, you are exposed to numerous threats. Uh, if we don't do that, the average user will not show understanding to uh, the upcoming danger. And that's a fact. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting, Nicholas, because if you think of it, we hear, we hear so rarely um, mainstream or even in conversations with people about experiments to see what can be breached right you only hear when there's been a data breach that affected a real a real data breach say or a real security incident but it's really important to get that message out look we've done like you have done studies that show look this is how easy it is to to um compromise these devices you're using and it's I don't think, like you're saying, I, don't, I think so many people would just take that for granted um, that the device is safe, right? Because they don't, they don't hear about it or they don't hear about any of the vulnerabilities. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting research. Uh, thank you for that. So Tim asks, have you done any survey of what IoT devices are most likely to be found in the wild in the UK? Uh, no, and I have to be honest that uh, Chris Kelly, that uh, mostly performed the experimentations, is uh, uh, an honor student, uh, was an honor student, now he's finishing his master's, and this was his final year project. So this work was feasible through uh, the funds that a, a final year project uh, could make possible. Uh, a survey, uh, you have a point that uh, should, be, should be done, but you need to take into consideration about the longevity of the project. So if you publish a survey in the next couple of months, it's going to be obsolete after four or five months because those devices are getting refreshed all the time. So uh, it, it might be possible, but again, we would rather need statistics from, ven from vendors such as Amazon. So uh, which devices are, uh, are most, po most popular? Um, uh, yeah, so which devices are not sold? And in that case, I don't know if vendors like Amazon, as I said, uh, or carriers or whatever, are willing to share those data because they're kind of private. 